All right. Hello, everybody. My name is Angela Tollerson. Um, I'm uh, the leader of the Flathead Valley Beekeepers. Um, you can find our website at flatheadvalleybeekeepers.club. We have monthly meetings. And um, this talk is called, Is Beekeeping for Me? I'm going to do my best to talk you out of keeping bees. <laughs> for those of you that have the spirit of tenacity by the end, we'll talk about next steps. Um, so in order to um, get things kicked off, one of you lucky people in here are going to get two ounces of honey from my bees. This is local honey, treatment free. I do not add chemicals to my hive. It's delicious. It has just enough canola in it to be extra sweet. So I'm going to ask a trivia question. I'm going to lead up to it. So right after a queen is born, she leaves the hive to go mate. What is the area called where she finds drones to mate? Anybody? Any guesses? Okay, we'll move on. Oh, what? what is it? I said Kate. Rude. Oh. No, no, it's called a drone congregation area. Okay, let's try again. We'll try, <laughs> we'll try another one. Um, this is about two ounces of honey, which is about 12 teaspoons. Whoever can guess the closest to how many bees it took to make this little jar of honey will get it. Any guesses? 2,000. 2,000. 50. 50. 1,200. Anybody else? 2,500. 6,000. 50. 100. One. Back there. <laughs> she, she said it first. Somebody else said 50. So it took yeah. 48 bees to make this. Wow. Yeah. Good Good job. Job. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so those little bears that you buy, about 12 ounces, it took 288 bees to make that. Each bee only makes in her entire lifetime, which is about six weeks long, a quarter of a teaspoon of honey. Wow, wow. About, and then the, these boxes here, this box here, which weighs about eight pounds, it will take 23,000 40 bees to fill this box with honey in a season. So, all right, I want to remind everybody, it is so easy for you to lead me down a path of digression by <laughs> raising your hand and asking a question or a comment. So let's hold all questions to the very end. Write your question down so you don't forget it. And at the end, we'll tackle it if we have time. Oh, uh, some more information about me, if you're wondering why I'm qualified to do this. Um, I've been beekeeping, this will be my ninth year, and I went to the University of Montana online and over the course of three years, got my certification to become a master beekeeper. So that is that is what I'm doing here. All right, so let's talk about the basics before we dig into this, because I'm going to be throwing terms at you that might be a bit confusing, so let's just talk about the basics. A hive is the man-made box bees live in, not a reference to the bees. You can have hives on your property that are empty. It's important to know. A colony is one superorganism living in one hive or nest, which is what we call them in the wild, comprised of about 60,000 bees, young resources, and one queen. You can see there on the slide, that is an example of a hive. On your left, on your right is a nest in the wild. There's a colony in the one on the right. There's none in the hive. Now, a nuke is short for a nucleus colony, which is sold to beekeepers. It contains a queen and 10,000 bees, and it's on five frames of honeycomb with honey, pollen, and brood, which is baby bees. You can see that picture there on the left. A package is a screened box of 10,000 bees with no resources, and a queen who is trapped in a small cage, and they usually have a can of sugar syrup. Sir, can I ask you to close that door? The talk in the other room is, is that okay? Oh, yeah. yeah okay. I apologize. Yeah. That, no, 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 that's okay. I didn't want people to feel like they weren't welcome to come in at first. Okay. Um, the nucleus on the left will cost about $200 these days. The package on the right will cost about $800 or $185 these days. Now, a deep is a large box that's an example we have here at the bottom. Um, and that is uh, about 10 inches high, and it is weighs 80 pounds when it's full. Um, it's usually reserved for brood. 
Why? Because you want the area to fill up nicely and get a nice population of bees. There will be a bit of honey on the outside of each frame, but it's not a full frame of honey. And you do not want to be lifting 80 pound boxes constantly off of the top just to get to your bees in order to um, manipulate them. That would be effective for your back. Um, most people keep one to two uh, deep boxes. A medium is a box almost seven inches high. You can see it there on the top. And it weighs about 60 pounds when it's full of honey. It's usually used for honey, but it can be for brood. You can make the decision to run all medium boxes. Uh, the only caveat to that is when you purchase your nuke from a supplier, it's going to be a deep so you're gonna, at least your first year starting off, you would need to have a deep box to accommodate that frame. <clears throat> All right, so now we're gonna talk about some bee myths that you may have. First myth, bees can be aggressive to visitors on or near my property, especially Africanized bees. Well, that's false. Bees can be defensive right near their hive when triggered by certain stressors. Um, but and Africanized bees are the most defensive, but Africanized bees cannot survive Montana. They need very warm weather. So the only way an Africanized bee would get up here is that if they were accidentally shipped up here by uh, a bee seller to you, and they would not last the winter. Anyways. Next myth. Um, I am allergic to bees. I swell up like a blimp for days. Well, technically allergic reaction is the right clinical term. However, most people, when you say allergic, they are jumping to the extreme, which is anaphylactic shock with a failure to breathe. Um, that is actually pretty rare. And um, swelling is normal. And the more you're stung, the less sen your sensitivity will be. Honeybees are in danger and agriculture could collapse without them. That's mostly false. There are plenty of honeybees. There are plenty. Um, but only certain specialty crops are pollinated by honeybees at a commercial lever, level. However, beneficial insect populations in general are in danger, including our native pollinators. Talk more about that in a minute. Honey never spoils. False. Honey can ferment if there is too much water content or if you leave it open to absorb environmental moisture. If the bees have capped the honey, you can know that there's not going to be too much moisture under that cap. Bees know to cap honey somehow, we don't know how, at exactly 18% water content, which is what keeps it um, good for thousands of years. <clears throat> Beekeeping is time consuming. Well, it doesn't have to be. Some keepers only get in their hives twice a year, but researching and learning for a full year before you purchase bees is highly recommended. I don't want you to make the wrong monetary decisions leading up to purchasing your bees. So why do you want to keep bees? I'm going to ask for a little bit of audience participation with raising of hands. A lot of these things I'm going to mention, you're going to say, well, yeah, that's also a reason why I want to keep bees. But I want you to think about in your head right now, the very first thought that comes, and then try to raise your hand at the first thought you just thought about. All right, are we ready? Okay, first reason, honey. Oh, yeah. Especially raw, local honey know where it came from. It's delicious. It's one of the biggest reasons. Pollination. Yeah. You're worried you haven't seen as many honeybees in your yard. You have lots of vegetables and you want to make sure those are getting pollinated. Very true. To help save the bees. Yep. That's a, that's a big common one. People want to help out and they, they're endearing creatures. Other byproducts like wax or apotherapy. There you go. That's more answers. Fascination. Very good. Of all of these ones on here, if there is return, which is the most likely for you to still be beekeeping three years from now? Fascination. If you are not doing this because you are fascinated and curious, you are not going to stick with this hobby. If you're doing it for any of the pre other previous reasons as your primary. Now, I'm not saying then you picked out, leave the room. You don't get to keep these. <laughs> not at all. My hope is that you would develop fascination as you research to keep the bees. 
Beekeeping requires a tenacious and curious spirit. Now, I want everyone to understand I'm speaking from a person who is trying to keep bees in Northwest Montana. <laughs> you have to be tenacious because you are going to have losses. And we're going to talk about that. Things to know before I start. <clears throat> Challenges with Flathead County. <laughs> We have one of the shortest forage seasons and coldest average monthly temps in all of Montana. So even though there are other places that get colder than us, they seem to have sooner forage window because they might have more sun, might be a little bit more southerly. So we, we have some pretty extensive challenges. No commercial bees over winter in Montana. All the pros avoid winter by migrating their bees down south for the whole winter, and almost all purchasable bees are overwintered in warmer climates that you're buying and you're receiving in April and May. All right, expense, starting with two hives, which I highly suggest, plus one extra single deep setup in case you have a swarm your first year and you're wondering where do I put this, you know, now I have three colonies, where do I put this third one I got off my tree? You would need to have an extra box set up um, it's going to be over $1,500 startup cost, including all of the new equipment that you see here times two <laughs> for two hives and the bees. Um, what is the winter survival rate? Well, experienced beekeepers, which have been doing it for three years plus, experience 50 to 70% success in our area. New beekeepers, zero to 50% success. So, uh, and I consider new like your first two years. So just want to let that settle in. I see a lot of faces just went. <laughs> Varroa mites and disease. Beekeeping is harder than ever and requires action in our northern climates. We're going to talk about the Varroa mite in another slide if you're wondering what that is. A tenacious spirit is required. A myriad of challenges and failures will be presented to you. Being resilient and trying again is necessary for the long haul. That's why I mentioned fascination is going to be one of your best friends. Well, what are some of the consequences of bee health decline? And why is it a faltering commodity? Well, nukes, which are five frame nucleus colonies with a queen, cost about $200 each this year. Um, there are about 1.7 million hives that are required to pollinate the almonds and other various um, agricultural uh, pollination needs each year. And around 50% average losses each winter are experienced in the Northern Rockies, 41% nationally. And in Montana in 2011, we reported 81% losses of our bees in one winter. Now the suggested bare minimum hive count in case of those level of losses is five hives, but that would be a cost of $1,000 a year to replace your bees if you lost all five. I suggest at least two because it's very hard for you to understand what is a healthy colony versus a failing colony unless you have both. If you only have one, you may have gotten unlucky and got a failing colony and you have no concept of what a healthy one should have looked like. So that's why we say two. Also to buy yourself a little bit more insurance. If you are gonna lose 50% of your bees, maybe you will use one and you'll still have one. Finally, um, Southern bees are migrated to Montana for our purchase and they have no local adaptation. Over in the uh, Eastern side of the world, bees migrated over millennia up into colder areas and only the, the ones that had the most chance of survival were able to survive those colder areas. Because of the way we move bees all over this country so freely now, we don't give them those chances to naturally adapt as they move north. So we're trying to pull bees that are used to, hey, in February, there are, you know, hundreds of thousands of acres of almond trees ready for you to pollinate. So what do they do? They start brooding up in February. What's going on right now in February here? They're going to put all of their resources into developing brood in anticipation of almond trees that aren't going to be there when they go to fly out, right? So that's a problem. Now, Jonathan Lundgren, he's a regenerative agriculturalist, and he said, today, agriculture has acted like a meteorite hitting the earth, and humans are selecting for species that can survive in an agrochemical-laden, highly simplified landscape. 
Many insect species have become casualties of our decisions and we're reshaping biological communities on a rapid time scale the planet has never experienced before. Honeybees are becoming one such casualty. So, Varroa destructor mite, are they a problem or are they a symptom of what Jonathan was just talking about? Well, the Varroa parasites are in the tick family and they feed on the fat bodies, which is like the endocrine system uh, for us, which affect the bee's protein dependent abilities and they vector viruses that the bee historically was able to combat. But now when you have a little critter on you, injecting those viruses into you as they feed you, you're a little less likely to combat them. They entered the US just in the late 1980s. They have not been here for very long. So our bees as a species have not had time to have that balance event with this other parasite. It's, it's just too soon. And so the way we have combated it in America is we have placed insecticides in the hive to kill the harmful insect that is feeding on the beneficial insect. And um, the parasites that continue to live in the hive, and they do continue to live after you've used a treatment, um, they are the ones that can survive the pesticide or the mass casualty event that Jonathan was referring to. So we are creating, we are choosing and selecting for the strongest mites that survived, right? That insecticide. Um, treatments are often lethal or sublethal to the queens, the workers, the brood, and definitely to humans. Um, honey and byproducts are now tainted with unwelcome chemicals that the EPA and the FDA have varying levels on their human safety, but they do build up over time. And because of that, a lot of people will not continue to save this kind of comb past two or three years. This is like the liver of the hive. Um, it is fat philic and it absorbs all of those insecticides, not just the ones that you might have to put in the hive to deal with varroa mites, but whatever the bees are foraging for. If they're foraging on a flower where any kind of herbicide, insecticide, or um, fungicide was used, they're bringing it back into the hive without your choice in the matter. And that's why you cannot have organic honey in our country. All right, um, finally, the only non-chemical consumer accessible approach to dealing with them is what's called a varroa sensitive hygiene bee or VSH. Um, they have shown adaptive behaviors for controlling varroa and the queens are purchasable for replacing your non-hygienic queens. So most likely, unless they advertise differently, the queens that you're getting in your nucleus from um, a bee supplier are just your basic bee. They have no special hygienic abilities. You can replace the queen with a queen that has these proven hygienic abilities and then have a better chance of um, them dealing with the varroa mite. You can see right there on that bee, the two little varroa mite, you see the little red? It's like, yep, those are, those are the varroa mite. All right, so let's say at this point, I had just talked to you about keeping bees for yourself. But you want to know what can I do though, because I still have great interest and concern for them. So I'm going to tell you what these possible approaches are. Or if you're also a beekeeper, these may be applicable to you. First of all, as a home and business owner, leave the dandelions and the non-noxious weeds, so the ones that are legal to have, um, alone. Bumbles, solitary bees, butterflies, honeybees, hoverflies, beetles, goldfinches, house spar sparrows, all of those critters depend on dandelions as their first food out of the winter. So if you can leave those, it would be wonderful. Next, don't use any pesticides, herbicides, or fungicides on plants while they are in flower. That's when your pollinators would be visiting them, right? Um, consider replacing your lawn with pollinator plants or overseeding the lawn with white clover seed. That would be beneficial. Um, know that honeybees are loyal to one type of a plant a day. By type of a plant, I mean like a cherry blossom. They'll only go to cherry blossoms all day. They will not go to an apple blossom that whole day. Um, so buy plants in diverse groups. Don't buy a single plant of each type 
when you go to you know your favorite uh, greenhouse um, because that bee is most likely not going to be able to visit that plant in multitudes, right? If you bought a single one. So think about buying at least 10 um, or five to 10 of one particular plant if you're trying to give them um, choices. Um, your best choices are purples, reds, blues, and fragrance and herbs. They love those. If you see a swarm, use the call now button at the Flathead Valley Beekeepers Association group page, um, or you can go to our website and click on the swarm report link and you can report a swarm. Now, um, what are sustainable solutions for a hobby beekeeper? Well, first of all, don't, don't buy bees, capture swarms for free. There are many, many swarms in our valley every year and you could potentially capture one. I do not have the time to go into detail how you would do that in this class, but if you come to um, our club, we'll be happy to explain how you might use an empty box to capture bees that we're looking for a home. Don't worry, you're not stealing somebody else's bees. That's not how it works. <laughs> These bees are looking for a home to go to. Um, Baited traps placed in trees or against building capture swarms, and after a week or two, the frames can be moved into your hive in an apiary. Um, also, make splits from your winter survivors. Try not to import queens, but use your own survivor eggs. Whatever eggs that queen is producing, if she survives the winter, there's a very good chance she's going to pass those traits on, and you're going to get survivor traits um, of bees that can handle our winters for whatever reason. Um, Replace queens with VSH queens. I mentioned that already. And you can make bee-centric choices, not keeper-centric, when your pocketbook is not at stake. So if you're not having to rebuy bees at the cost of $200 a colony, multiple colonies every single year, if you're just capturing swarms, um, then you aren't going to feel like you have to make choices that maybe you don't completely agree with, but yet you feel like it's the only way to protect your investment. As far as landowners, sustainable solutions, there's a pollinator initiative program where you can get free seeds from the Flathead Valley Conservation District. Um, they're probably downstairs, aren't they? Yes. So you can get free seeds to help the pollinators. There is a cost share funding program for pollinator habitats, and that's provided through the Flathead Valley NRCS, where they will actually pay for you to plant pollinator habitat. Um, also consider cover crops instead of tillage and animal foraging instead of synthetic fertilizers. And consider purchasing native bees like the Blue Orchard Mason bee. Do we have a gentleman here again this year who was offering the solitary bees? He had a table yeah. down there last I year. I Does anybody see, Does anybody see him? Is okay. he there? That's okay, perfect. yeah. Go talk to him. Very little... Um, effort required from you. You're not having to worry about bees maintaining honey and resources over a winter, yet you still are going to have a huge amount of the benefits that we talked about on that previous slide of reasons why you might want to have bees. So that's a good option. What are some sustainable solutions for farmers and gardeners? Well, first, you, there are safe pesticides for veggie gardens like Bacillus thuringiensis, and it's also referred to as Bt. Um, but you'll want to make sure you're using target specific products out of the BT. For example, BT, I'm going to butcher this, Isawai is toxic to bees. So you would want to make sure you read the label and check on that. Um, also, as a farmer, plant hedgerows between crops with native flowers. And um, for everyone, re uh, reconsider regenerative agriculture instead of using biocides. If you wanna know what regenerative agriculture is, some influencers right now in that world are Mark Shepard, Gabe Brown, Jonathan Lundgren, and you can go to bgirl.org. If you search any of these people, there's going to be TED Talks, YouTubes from these people about what regenerative agriculture um, can gain us. All right, for those of you I have not talked out of keeping bees, this slide is for you. So getting started. First, we have a local club meetings the last Tuesday of the month at 6.30 p.m. on the second floor of the Flathead County Health Department. And there's no fee to come. We do not take uh, collect any money. 
Um, I teach classes at FBCC uh, for beginning beekeeping May. This year, it'll be the last two Saturdays of May. Uh, they do not have that class schedule out yet, but if you get one in the mail, watch for the summer um, catalog, or maybe you subscribe online. You can also register online for their classes, and that will be in there. You can also take online classes through the University of Montana, like I talked about. As far as winterizing choices, the reason that I'm bringing this up now, normally this is a detail that I would actually talk about as it gets closer to winter in the bee club. However, because you're gonna be making the decision now to buy equipment, I need to point this out. I highly, highly suggest looking into polystyrene. This is a, these are polystyrene. They are um, made out of a heat pressed styrofoam. see here. They're slightly thicker than standard wood um, boxes that you would purchase, but they're lighter than wood is a benefit. Um, this has seven times the insulation of its wood counterpart that you will purchase. And bees are used to having um, anywhere from five to uh, probably huge amounts, but it, and on average five to seven inches of wood in the tree around them. They live in live trees, by the way, not dead ones. They find holes or cavities in the live trees. And that tree, five to seven inches, is delivering about an R factor, insulation factor of up to seven for them. And then we put them in boxes that are three quarters of an inch wide, the wood boxes that are traditionally used for beekeeping and expect them to not be stressed out and survive our winters up here in Montana. And I just have found that that is not realistic for us. Cannot keep bees the way that people do in, in the more temperate parts of the country. So if you have, a, these are not necessarily green. I understand polystyrene might not be a green choice. If you wanna make a more green choice, you can wrap your hives in homemade wraps with sheep's wool. And we do have several people with sheep in the valley. In fact, there's a talk right now happening by my mentors about merino wool. Um, I also keep sheep. We have belly wool. It's very common for you. There's very few things you can do with belly wool and um, sheep farmers will practically give it away. And you can use that belly wool to create what we would consider a more green um, insulation. Um, windbreaks are a must. A lot of the heat loss is from the, the wind pummeling. And depending on where you are in the valley, that's going to be a much bigger deal. I'm in West Valley. I have a great view of the glacial notch. I also experience negative 50 wind chills, right? So I keep straw bales around my beehives to break the wind. Um, also, another must I have found is feeding pollen substitute patties starting in roughly March. The thing you need to keep in mind is that our last pollen at best October, at worst September, the bees, the winter bees have to go nearly six months before they can experience pollen again, because our first pollen is maybe April and different parts of April frequently. And that they have to use the protein in their bodies to create brood in February, March, and April. If they're also trying to keep warm because we have several false springs, as you know, we have several little winter bouts that return, the bees can't do both. So I found doing what are called pollen substitute patties starting in March, kind of help get them through those last few months of winter here. As far as purchasing bees, if you wanna know where to purchase bees, you need to go to our website that I have listed here. Um, on our resources page, um, title, menu title, and then bee purchasing. And that will give you all of your options of where you can purchase bees, both locally or taking a little bit of a drive in Montana. And Queens will be there. And then as far as equipments and books, um, I would go to our website again, click on the getting started link at the top. I have everything there you could possibly imagine, including links to, I hope, um, equipment that hasn't been deprecated on Amazon now that you think about it because you know how stuff changes sometimes it's two years old so I should check on that that's an action item for me but um, it's have some really great descriptions there of everything you might need the cost um, I highly suggest a minimum of two hives 
Uh, this slide is outdated. I'm just realizing when I did free the seeds event three years ago to say 1200, it's now 1500 with inflation costs. That's about 600 um, um, or $300 per hive. And remember when I say hive, I'm talking about the equipment. And then about 360 to 400 um, for the bees themselves. Uh, two colonies, and then roughly $200 for pr protective gear and tools. The bare minimum that you'll need is you'll need a smoker, you'll need a hive tool, and you'll need a veil or a jacket um, with veil. Um, you do not need a full suit to keep these. If you're trying to find ways to save on money a little bit. Um, suits or um, just wearing baggy jeans is fine. And baggy is important. Um, ask me how I know. <laughs> so, um, okay. And then um, that, oh, I thought I had a, that was, okay. So we have time for questions. Is it really only Oh, that clock, the, the clock stopped. Is, yes, it's, it's 105. <laughs> it's 105. Okay, we have time for some questions. So, any questions? Yes. You were talking about what <clears throat> what stresses we need to make him a little more aggressive, but I have a neighbor who wants to take a car across the alleyway where there's dogs and transients and garbage trucks and all that kind of stuff and people all the time right on the alleyway. Will that stress those bees? Yes. Yes. Um, and um, I would say more so the problem with putting it in an alleyway is they're going to be highly susceptible to vandalism. Um, so if somebody were to, if somebody walk up and lift up a hive and knock it over, they're going to learn real fast why they shouldn't have done that. Um, so I, that's not the vandalism I'm talking about. I'm talking about people realizing that they could stand at the end of the alleyway and shoot it with a pellet gun or throw rocks at it or hit it with a car. Yeah. So that would be a mistake from the person who's wanting to keep the bees. Uh, the thing that the thing that's going to be the most stressful for bees is in the fall or late summer when you decide to take their honey. That's a very stressful event. And for a couple days afterwards, the bees are going to be extra defensive and may see your, your innocent neighbor who walked out into their yard and go and sting them. And that's not, and I'm not talking about swarming, I'm talking about one or two bees, guard bees would go over and sting. For the most part, I used to think that wasn't a big deal. And then an elderly woman called me last year and said that she desperately needed help. Her neighbors, um, are keeping bees, even though they know that she is um, actually goes into anaphylactic shock when she's stung by bees. She's been in the hospital, was in the hospital once. They took honey from the bees, and then she walked up to hang her clothes on the line about 30 feet from them, and they came over and stung her, and she ended up in the ER again and almost died. And she wanted to know, what's your advice of how do I approach them? Because technically, it's not illegal for them to have bees, in the in town, but ethically, it, are they really making the best decisions for her? That's something that she could not have avoided. She did not do anything wrong. So keep that in mind when you're thinking about, do I need to get with my neighbors? Is this wrong? I would say for anyone who's immediately adjacent to your property, not your whole neighborhood, but anyone adjacent to your property, go and talk to them. Offer to give them free local, some of your honey once you make it. If you don't make honey that year, go buy them a small jar of local honey. Seriously, <laughs> don't lie to them. Say, well, I didn't get any honey this year, but I promised you I was going to give you local honey. So here's from somebody I got at the farmer's market, you know, but extend some goodwill to get them excited about it. Tell them you'd love to talk about it. Get them on board before you just put them there. It is extremely scary for some people for a very good reason. So just keep that in mind. And, and the bees aren't going to go like a mile away. Like this is, we're talking. A special yeah. event where they've got stressed out right. and then they see a person and they think you're the reason for my trouble. I'm going to go after you. Bees are not defensive about their forage. So a bee coming over to a neighbor because the neighbor is in the vegetable garden and the bee is browsing, they're not defensive of the flower and irritated that a person is next to their flower. They have zero things to be defensive about that flower. They're defensive about their brood and their honey back in their hive, not the flower. Yes. I have two questions mm -hmm. for you. I had like lost like crazy last year. 
I was told that if you have these, you won't have wasps. Not necessarily. You no. Don't. No. Mm -hmm. Okay. Also, I had um, I had built a bluebird house and put it up in one of our um, trees, uh -huh. and I had some sort of bee move into there and hang out for a while. And mm -hmm. I thought, oh, that's so cool. I sat there and watched it do their thing, and then they disappeared. They they actually closed up the the hole there. Yes, and um, disappeared out of there, and then a squirrel moved. Mm -hmm. Something I could have done to keep them you know in there well i don't know what kind of bee it was i know several solids so um all bees even our solitary bees they'll um, overwinter as a queen and then they will eventually go find a home it could have been paper wasps it could have been yellow jackets it could have been a mason bee it, there's so many different things it could have been um usually when honeybees pick a home they pick a home exactly the size of this box here it sounds like what you're describing was too small to accommodate in a colony of bees, which has at least like 50,000 bees. Well, I know there weren't wasps. That's a very yeah. fine <laughs> yeah. place. Yeah, so yeah, I does not sound like mm -hmm. kind of Yes? Um, you were talking about the queens that are uh, BSH like safer resistant? Yes. Um, what makes them a hygienic bee? Is it a genetic function or is it how they root their body? What makes them a hygienic Yeah. So for uh, those of you online who maybe cannot hear the question, what makes a queen VSH or varroa sensitive hygiene? So um, bees are hygienic just by traits and have been for millennia. And bees have adaptive ability. And one of their highest reasons for adaptability is that a queen mates with 15 to 20 different drones. Drones, each of those drones injecting different DNA abilities. And those abilities are triggered by different environmental issues like proteins. And it's all very complicated, but very fascinating, I promise you. So um, what happens is when um, a creature or sorry, a bee is trying to adapt to a stressor, those genetics come into play and they will actually exhibit behaviors that will show that they are better with dealing with that stressor than others. And we have just been waiting for that to appear. We finally witnessed it. And essentially for Varroa, what it means is a couple of things. One, they will detect that the larva that's down in the cell hat is stressed out, that it's sick. They can smell that it's sick, that the varroa mite is on it. And they will pull it out with the varroa attached and throw it outside. And so they're actually, and because the varroa mite is inside um, consuming the bee and mating, they just interrupted that mating cycle and threw that female out. So that's an example of hygienic. Bees are incredible with their sense of smell. They can smell for miles and they can actually tell the difference between a healthy bee and an unhealthy bee. They can tell the difference by smell through a, a male bee and a female bee. It's pretty interesting. Yes. The difference between a solid bottom and a screen bottom. Yes. Which is better? <laughs> right. So that's a very interesting question. Um, in general, I would say uh, up until uh, the point that I started keeping bees this way, I would say a solid bottom because you do not want air coming up into and hitting the brood in the bottom. So during the forage months, definitely closed. However, one of the, the discoveries that I made through my master's work with the college was that we have traditionally had holes up here and vented out what we thought was harmful moisture out of the top, thinking that condensation was going to kill bees in the winter, it actually does not. And so I've changed to a system where this is closed on the top, so that hot air is trapped inside the hive all the time. But what that means is that we need extra exchange of good clear air, and that needs to happen in the bottom. So in the winter only, I pull that tray out and the screen is exposed. However, because bees uh, hives are up on stands, you would have frigid cold air blowing up underneath, right? So I set the hive on top of a piece of wood to stop the wind from blowing in. But there's little feet here that raises this up half of an inch. And so still air can go in and interchange with the bees and be making sure that there's fresh air making it into the colony. 
it's a very complicated question. You're probably just going to expect me to say yes or no, but yeah, right. I have a question. Yes. So do you have an opinion about the different species of bees? Because if you look, you know, they'll say, oh, they're Italian or they're... Right. So first of all, and I'm sorry that I'm going to sound like I'm being a know-it-all and correcting yeah. you, but there's only one species and that's the Apis mellifera, which is the Western bee. What you're talking about are the sub races. And the sub races are your Italian, your Russian, your Carniolan, your Caucasian. So the sub races within the species of the Western honeybee, there it's there's no such thing, no such thing. Bees open mate with ten to twenty different drones, and you have no control over that. And so if you were to take you more what you could call the bees we have in North America are North American bees. Because at this point, they have mingled and mingled repeatedly to the point that they have varying degrees of percentages of each of those subraces. The only subrace that can claim that they're very, very close to 100% is if you purchase a Russian bee from an uh, official Russian bee breeder. I believe there's only six to eight in this country. They have worked to dial back and remove all of the contamination of other bees, but they do it through artificial insemination is how they're controlling so yeah, what when somebody tells you on their website that they're selling a Carniolan or a Russian or an Italian, what they do is they look at the color of the queen and they associate with what colors normally went with those original subraces in the parts of the world that they, you know, developed and saying, oh, well, this is a super dark one. We're going to call this Carniolan and sell it to the person that's Carniolan. When in reality, it might be 80% Italian, 5% Carniolan, and you know, 15% Caucasian. So there are definite traits of different bees and uh, where they originally um, developed in other countries. Some have do better with cold, some do better with pests. That's a, uh, that's a thing, but there's no way for you to be guaranteed that by purchasing those particular types of bees online. That's actually a misnomer. And it's referring more to her color when she comes out. Okay. Yes. How much opening around the hive can you take? Like, it says don't put it up against the building close to your grid barriers. How much room do we actually need to make it like a building? Um, so people, that's what's crazy. You. I could turn this entrance towards um, a fence or a building and only give them one feet. And the bees will accommodate themselves by walking around and lifting off of here where they have open. So don't stress about that too much. I can tell you that in general, when bees are coming in very laden with nectar or pollen, it's hard for them. Have you ever seen, have you guys seen the videos where the bees are running into each other in slow motion online? Yeah. <laughs> oh my goodness. So they need about 15 <laughs> feet clearance to come and go at the speeds that they want to come, especially if they're laden with nectar. So about 15 feet, it's why you do not personally want to stand right in front of a hive in the middle of the day trying to do your manipulations. They're going to be, you're in their way, you know, so they're not going to sting you because you're in your way, but you know, you're going to be in their way. So um, I wouldn't worry too much about accommodating for that. Yeah. Are there any questions online? No. Okay. Check. All right. Anybody else? Yes. Well, last question. You sort of answered most of the startup questions I have, and I still a lot of research. Yeah. Um, are there any organizations in Calspell and Adley that sell bulk beeswax? Or do you know where I'd pick some of the company? Like, well, um, so Western Bee down in Polson does, but up here in the Flathead, um, I don't know. Um, Great Northern Honey Company, I would check with them. They're one of our local companies and they would be able to redirect you. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Um, where do you get the pollen substitute patties? Um, you can purchase the patties or you can purchase just the actual pollen substitute and powder from Murdoch's okay. if you want to go local. Um, the, the concern I have with that is that I don't know how long their products have been sitting on the shelf and protein does degrade over time if it's not to put in a freezer. So I would suggest maybe purchasing, uh, uh, fresh, any beekeeping supply website will be fine. Um, um, Dadent, D-A-D-A-N-T is a company. 
um, Better B is a company you can go with. Um, there'll probably be several resources on our website where I've mentioned uh, BQB supply. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes. Is your uh, sign up sheet for scores online? Yes. Online? Yes. If you want help, um, actually, if you want to go out and help capture a swarm that's been reported by your community, you can do so with a mentor as long as a mentor is available at the time. The way that the swarm list works is I take everybody's name and number down. I send you a text that says, hey, this is Angela. Add me to your contacts because if you get a call from me, I am not going to leave a voicemail. I get too many people calling me back later because they realize, you know, I left a voicemail about a swarm and they really, really want it. By then I've, I'm already 10 people down the list. So, um, and then if you go out and you collect a swarm with me or a mentor, then I move you down to the bottom of the list and then the next person has a chance. So I, that's how I systematically go through it. But yes, you can go to our website to sign up for it there. Yes. So I have these making a nest in a tree mm -hmm. last summer, but it was really high up and I couldn't tell what kind they were. Is there someone that would help if they show up again this year? Oh yes, you would reach out the same okay. way. You would reach out to me and we would have somebody come and determine. Okay. Yeah. Is it their yellow jacket phone? No, but if they're going to be as old as lately. Yeah, guess what? <laughs> yellow jacket tree. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're pollinators and they're very efficient pollinators. However, when they're in areas that's high human traffic, they need to go. They're a nuisance and they need to be taken care of. Yes, yes. But um, yeah, I would not destroy them just for the sake of destroying them if they're not antagonizing you because they are beneficial pollinators. Yeah, they are. So they're different. Remember how I was telling you bees are not defensive of a food source? A yellow jacket is defensive of its food source, right? So yes, they... They can just because you're existing in the spot they want to be go after you. Yes. <laughs> yeah. They're like, this is mine. <laughs> um, I should point out um, going and collecting a swarm, which is bivouacked on a, a limb or a post, is not the only way to collect swarms. You can, and I, I mentioned this, if you want to come to our club, we'll explain in detail, but you can take a box, whether you make it from a um, blueprint that you got on YouTube or online, um, or if you just want to use a box of an actual beehive, that's perfectly acceptable too. And you put lemongrass oil um, in it and that attracts a swarm and they will pick it and just move into it. So you do not have to go physically collect a swarm, which can seem really daunting and overwhelming. You can just trap them in a box. But again, that's an hour long talk itself. So definitely please consider coming to our meetings. Um, the, it's moving and it's correct again. Yes, it's correct again. Oh, is that possible? I don't know. It was flipping around. <laughs> it said new 25 minutes ago. And, and it, now, was, it was flipping around. <laughs> that's crazy. Okay. Um, if you, um, there are cards, I have business cards over there that have all of the details on there in case you didn't have a chance to write it down as far as our website, when our meeting is, where it is, please grab a card. Um, if you want to sign up for our newsletters for our website, please walk over there and put your name down um, and your email. I only send out like maybe one a month. I'm not going to inundate you with emails. And it's really just if I make a post on there, you get notified of you know some big news on the website. So feel free to sign up and I will go add you. And any other questions? Thank you, Angela.